Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on how to stand out as a marketing student in the interview process. Um, my name is Liz Wessel. I'm the co-founder and CEO at WayUp. Um, many of you guys might know WayUp because you're users of WayUp. If you're not, check us out at WayUp.com. We help employers find amazing, qualified, diverse, early career talent like many of you, and we help students uh, explore awesome opportunities and get hired. Um, and many of you guys are on this webinar because you want to learn how to stand out as a marketing student in the interview process. And just a little bit of background about how this webinar even got started in the first place. I met Michael at a, an event for CMOs and marketing leaders, um, and a really big topic was about how to recruit excellent talent. And we kept hearing from CMOs and heads of HR about some of the struggles they had when it came to actually recruiting um, great talent. And he and I sat together and we said, you know, some of these students and recent grads just don't realize that if they just tweak a few things about the interview process, it'll really improve their chances of getting hired. And so um, Rachel joined the conversation. Obviously, she's, she's one of the leaders at one of the best career service centers in the world, not just the country. And she, she was doing that conversation and we were all like, you know what, we need someone who's a practitioner, who's also in the field, who's done a million of those interviews from the other side and seen it firsthand as well. And so we asked Diana from Unilever to join. And so I'm really excited for today's webinar. So Rachel, I would love for you to actually introduce yourself first, if you could. Liz, thank you and welcome everybody. I'm so excited to be here today. So um, my name is Rachel Friend, as Liz mentioned, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Career Development here at the NYU School of Professional Studies. And I see so many familiar names popping up into the chat and on the attendee list. So good to see so many people that I actually know and have worked with. Um, and what I do at NYU is work with students to reach their professional goals. Um, pretty simple, whether you are a new professional or experienced professional in any of our NYU School of Professional Studies programs, um, you utilize the NYU SPS Wasserman Center. And I lead the team there in helping students not only find a job or internship, but really be career well throughout their entire uh, career journeys, um, all the way from graduation to, to retirement and beyond. And what we do is really ensure that students, like I said, not just know how to find a job, but find positions and opportunities and advancement that align with your values, your interests, that excel um, and help you build your strengths, and really find meaningful work. And just a very quick sentence about myself. For the past 12 years, I've worked with thousands of NYU students, primarily earning degrees in business fields uh, and help them reach their professional goals. And today, much of my work involves partnering with NYU students who are in our MS in Integrated Marketing and MS in Public Relations and Corporate Comm programs, um, which are two of our largest graduate programs at NYU. So I'm thrilled to be here, share my insight, and get to know many of you today. Great, and by the way, to everyone, your Q&A, Rachel has heard every question under the sun, so if you have any question, no matter how big or small, she's heard it, so don't be shy. I've already seen a lot of great questions coming in. Um, awesome, um, we'll go right to left. So Michael, would love to have you go next. Sure, if everyone hear me fine, okay, yep. Um, I'm Michael Diamond, I'm the Academic Director at NYU School of Professional Studies. Uh, for all of our integrated marketing and PR programs, and I'm a clinical assistant professor here. Um, we have about 1,200 students between our two graduate programs in marketing. We have an MS in marketing and an MS in PR and corporate comms, and about 250 faculty. Uh, so it's probably one of the largest graduate programs in the country for marketing and PR. Um, and among that faculty, many, many, uh, you know, are academics and have PhDs, but every single one of them uh, is a working professional. Uh, and they bring that into the classroom. And that's true for me too. I uh, was 20 years at Time Warner. I was in the role actually of a chief marketing officer and I've also played roles in um, investment and international growth and, and, and strategy. So happy to answer some questions more broadly, but uh, bring to the job, you know, 20 years of business experience um, and, and very much, uh, you know, dedicated now to helping young emerging professionals um, enter this wonderful profession of marketing and PR and provide as much as support along with folks like Rachel 
and corporate colleagues like um, Diana, you know, uh, these, these are the kind of people that we partner with and learn from. So absolutely delighted to be here and thank you, Liz, for setting this all up. And before we go to Diana, Michael, really quickly, I know it's hard to choose your favorite baby, but when you were CMO at Time Warner, did you have like, or, or any of your other marketing jobs, did you have a favorite campaign you ever worked on that you want to share really quickly? Um, early on, actually, as I was trying to break into the marketing, I was a strategist and I convinced the leaders that we needed to rethink our multicultural marketing strategy, which was the term of art those days. And we had a very large uh, base of Hispanic consumers in Texas and California and New York City and Florida. And uh, so we developed a phenomenal campaign. It was absolutely fascinating to learn about the market, you know, drive some change, get people together talking and create some really innovative, uh, smart work. So I'm very proud of that. And I lived on, we launched a whole package of new channels, international services, in-language programming and everything like that. So very, very cool project. Awesome. Awesome. That sounds great. All right, Diana, last but not least, go for it. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Liz. So excited to be here with you. Um, even remotely, I can feel your presence uh, through the screen. Uh, my name is Diana Jagannath. I'm currently a senior global brand manager uh, at Unilever. If you're not familiar with Unilever, we are a um, massive consumer packaged good company with a footprint in almost every nation um, in the world, uh, about 170,000 employees. Uh, some of our top brands include uh, Dove, Knorr, Hellman's, Ben & Jerry's, uh, really across personal care and foods, um, as well as some in the beauty and prestige uh, space. So, so a really exciting company to be a part of uh, with a truly global footprint. Um, and I've been at the company since 2013, working on brands like Dove, which I'm on currently. I've also worked on Vaseline and Q-Tips, which is a bit of a, a local jewel here in, in uh, the US. Uh, I started my career in digital media, online video startups, so seeing kind of both the big and little uh, side of the world and, and can give some insight into that. Um, and I got my MBA at, at Northwestern Kellogg before joining Unilever. So um, that's a little bit about me and really look forward to engaging with you all today. Fantastic. And I have to ask you too, again, I know it's probably hard to choose your favorite baby, but favorite campaign you've ever worked on at Unilever? I have two. Uh, <laughs> one would have been the launch of the Vaseline Healing Project, which was a social mission for Vaseline. Uh, Unilever, if you don't know, is, is all um, about Unilever Sustainable Living uh, Plan. And, and purpose is part of each and every one of our brands, something that it's much, it goes beyond just revenue and, and running the business, but also making sure that we're, we're doing right um, by the people we serve and by the planet. And so Vaseline um, partnered with Viola Davis and the NGO Direct Relief to launch the healing um, the Vaseline Healing Project back in 2016 now, um, and just working with Viola was so exciting. And, and what we got to do was uh, bring uh, services, medical training, Vaseline products um, to really help people in areas of crisis and disaster all over the world and, 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 and tell people about it. And it has only grown um, since then, reaching millions and millions of people. So it um, was exciting to kick that off. Um, and then everything that I've done on Dove um, has, been, has been super inspiring because it's all about real women and um, one of my favorite campaigns was the launch of Dove Derma Series, which was a line specifically for people with extremely dry skin and dry skin conditions like eczema and psoriasis and working with um, women who had these conditions, showing them in our advertising, letting them tell their stories and really um, changing the conversation and educating around um, what it's like to live with a skin condition, what it looks like, how it feels and, and really providing products that, that could bring a little bit of comfort uh, there. So, uh, so many more, but um, it's been an exciting ride so far. Awesome, and such a diverse range of campaigns, that's great. Well, let's turn the slide share off and um, go right into the questions. Now, I have a bunch of questions for you guys, but we are getting some really good ones from uh, the audience as well, so I'll switch over to that probably in 20 minutes. Um, but let's start with, for people who are just even thinking about going into marketing, or maybe they're, they're only a year or two into their marketing job, there are so many paths to take in marketing. We talked on, on one of the calls before this about how there's brand marketing, there's digital marketing, there's analytics, um, and, and so much more. So how do you all think that someone should decide which path to take, which roles to apply for? Um, and, and what are good ways for a student or a recent grad to even explore or understand the different paths before committing to one? Great, well, I can start with that. Um, 
I had a liberal arts background. I studied political economy. So as I was looking at the job market, I really didn't even know where to start. Um, and, and now that I've been in the industry for, you know, 10 plus years, the answer is it doesn't really matter. Um, so, so it's talk to people, understand what their careers are like, what they do on a daily basis, and then find a role that you can apply for where you're going to get a lot of responsibility right out of the gate. Um, and there are so many different ways and parts of marketing and types of companies. They can be very well known, like Unilever can be an absolute startup with five people. As long as you're going to be learning, that's going to help you get your feet wet, build your skills. Um, this is really a field where you learn on the ground. So whatever training you've had is going to get you to the, the job, but then on the job is where you're going to learn. And um, once you're in the greater industry, you'll have a better sense of where you might fit or what you might like to try. Um, but even in the past decade or so, it, it, marketing has changed so much what it means to market digital marketing, social media, all of these things um, that no one's a true expert because it's evolving faster than the speed of light. So find, find a company and really people that you're excited to work with and, and get ready to learn. Yeah, I would, I would build entirely on what Diana said. I, I started my career in a, in a completely different place. When I got out of undergrad, I worked in the theater. I came from the creative side. You know, I worked in the theater in the U.S. And, and in the U.K. And, you know, I got fascinated over time and ended up as a management consultant in things that are more about data and analytics and, and strategy. And, and I think that, you know, the more uh, range you bring to any role you play in marketing, the better. Yes. So, and I, I am concerned, I think, as Diana uh, is uh, recently contributed an article about this, which is about the specialization that's going on in our field too early. Because what we want of our marketers is, is that they are, are generally thoughtful and well prepared and curious, etc. And we'll probably talk a bit more about that later. The traditional view was always, you know, do you go to the agency side or do you go to the client side? You know, that was one sort of choice. And then the other choice was, do you go creative or do you go analytical? And I think I would encourage you, as Diana said, is it doesn't really matter where you start. I think you need to, uh, you need to constantly be intellectually curious and you try and you should be trying to learn new things all the time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you are a person who's feels much stronger in creativity or be it writing or visual imagery or whatever, you know, perhaps more drawn to what we sometimes call marketing communications or the advertising discipline, then go find out what those technologists do and what those uh, data scientists do. And I think you'll find as if you look at all the big M and A activity that's been going on in the industry recently, it's all about joining, you know, big creative agencies joining up with, data science driven agencies or technology platforms finding um, you know partners in creativity so you know as, as the poet says we contain multitudes you know and I think mar marketers must contain multitudes you, you the more the more you study learn stay curious the, the better off you are I'll just add two quick points. Um, one is obviously internships. So here at NYU, close to 98% of our undergraduates do partake in some sort of internship. And believe it or not, at the graduate level, it's almost 75%. So if you are a cur current student, I cannot underscore the importance of an internship. And one opportunity that you have now is that location is not a barrier. So you could look for a virtual internship at a company that quite honestly isn't located any anywhere near where you work or where you live, excuse me, because now these internships are going virtual. So you might be able to get an internship in a company or in a functional area of marketing that quite honestly wasn't available to you unless you were willing to travel miles to a city that you didn't either study or live in. And then lastly, same thing with industry events. Industry events are at your fingertips right now because they're virtual and often free because organizations don't have to charge students and professionals to come there and sit in a large conference room anymore, right? So many organizations are actually offering free virtual conferences and events um, throughout the summer. So take advantage of those. Those are great ways to explore what area or functional area of marketing or communications you might want to go down in the future. I, I would just Not plug bad. one. I, I plug one, Liz, uh, that we got uh, involved in at NYU and, and behind, which is the Can Lions. So Can Lions, which we were, uh, if you had come to NYU and, and things had gone normally, we would have been in Can this summer. We were taking a group of students to Can, but Can actually put their whole programming uh, in this thing called Can Live online for free. And I think I support Rachel's point entirely. You know, make yourself aware of those things. 
avail yourself of those things and you'll learn a lot. You'll, you'll effectively meet people. You can follow up with them later by LinkedIn and things like that. Very, there's a ton of good stuff going on. Either your university through our resources at NYU, uh, wherever you are, you know, we can help people uh, connect to those things. The fact that that is online for free is incredible. And I cannot underscore enough. I had no idea. So definitely take that advice. Um, that's awesome. I, I'm curious. So I remember my first job out of college was in marketing. I was in product marketing at Google. And I remember the reason I wasn't too picky about freaking out about which marketing job I was going to get was because they had a rotational program and they were very open about the fact that you could start in this job at Google and in marketing and you could go to another. But within the world of marketing, like how common or difficult is it to switch paths within marketing? I mean, Diana, you mentioned it doesn't really matter in your opinion. So is that because after a year or two, no one's going to ding you for choosing the wrong path or the path that's different than the one you want? Yeah, absolutely. And I can give a number of examples. So within Unilever itself, I have colleagues who've even started out in R&D or supply chain and have made their way to marketing. I have people started in insights and have made their way to marketing. So it's really about, you know, the more you learn about a very integrated company and see all the different functions, if you need to sort of up your technical skills, if you want to switch into supply chain, you probably have to do a couple courses, but like, you can move and and once you get a reputation for for how you work and 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 your your personal skills your personal mastery like that's what's going to get you there and and be able to to make the relationships to make uh the jump uh, uh, around any function and then within uh, many of these large companies like unilever we naturally rotate every two years so um for example we rotate brands but we also rotate sort of what we call global and local roles so you may be more on the innovation product development side for two years and then switch and work very much on the business ownership, p and management um, activation side. So um, there, there's built in learning for you so that you could be in one company for a very large chunk of your career and actually feel like you've worked at 10 different companies. So that's within the industry. And then as far as like the agency brand, even to the retailer side, you have people jumping from all of them um, up to very senior levels. So um, in some ways, at least within brand management, you do get a really holistic view. So it may inform you on where you might want to go, but um, certainly it's all possible and, and you, you start to have the relationships and the understanding of um, what's required to, to make a jump then. It's, it's very common and doable if you're motivated. I'm yeah. curious and if, oh, sorry, go for it, Michael. No, I, I had a very similar experience in my marketing career, Liz, that I, you know, I started out sort of in a research and analytics role uh, it built into more of a marketing strategy and marketing planning role, and then took on you know a, a line of PNL uh, about growing the business from existing customer base, and then became a CMO. So I, I think that these transitions, and and again, as I said, I came from an entirely different world to start start off with. Um, I do think you are in a good spot if you can join companies like uh, Unilever because. They obviously invest in your professional development, and that may be a thing we want to talk a little bit about later about the difference between big, small, or you know, the, the companies that are willing to invest in your education. You should look for, and that I think could be part of a discussion you have with with companies you join. But it's also very much down to the individual to be intellectually curious, to be actively engaged. You know, and um, you know the the idea that there. I once had someone say to me, "I have nothing to learn." You know. And that sort of just blew my mind because I think there's never a role or a position in which you have nothing to learn. And, and of course, with the availability of all sorts of wonderful courses online or certificate programs from NYU or whatever it is, you know, you can always pivot. Um, you know, I'll give you one very quick example. We're launching a certificate in healthcare marketing and communications in October, uh, in September, because there are lots of people working, say, in finance marketing or consumer goods who say, you know, actually, I'm more interested in working in healthcare, but I don't know anything about it. Yes. So there are ways like our certificate, which you can make those transitions. So you've got to be proactive about it. I don't think it's as hard as people fear and they sometimes convince themselves, you know, that becomes the reason why, you know, but I think there are lots of opportunities um, if you're constantly curious, uh, but also don't be too uh, precise, if you know what I mean, which is your career will take a strange path, yes? And you'll be disappointed if you're too like, I must be CMO by X date or within three years, you know, you got to let it play out a little bit, you know, and, and uh, welcome the unbidden, as, as they say. 
Awesome. Um, we are going to turn it over to audience questions soon, but just one or two more questions. I'm curious for each of you, what is the biggest mistake that you see students make when interviewing for marketing positions? If you could think of like the one biggest, or maybe if you can't choose between two, go for two. We'll do kind of rapid fire. I think the most common I'm seeing is just not doing your research. It is so easy to find out today about a company, listen to their leadership, you know, read articles, watch videos, get a sense for what the company is about, what their, you know, primary revenue streams are, their brands, what, whatever it is. Um, it, it, it's such an opportunity. Reach out on LinkedIn, try to talk to current employees who are there to get a feel for it, to show your interest. Um, that, that's the one thing that you see some people who feel like they're, they're ticking a box and kind of going to all the big companies or all the companies in a particular industry. And the truth is, while there are some similarities, there are, are some very significant cultural differences. And um, it also just shows uh, a level of, of care. And, and like, these are competitive jobs, right? So, so the more you can stand out and, and give that confidence that you, that you want this, that you get it, you can ask the right questions, makes, makes a huge difference um, for you to land your stories, if it's Star Method or whatever else. You know, like we, we're used to the, the marketing nuts and bolts, but we want to understand who you are um, and what makes you special and, and a good fit for, for a company like ours. I'll build on that a little bit, Diana. Great point right at the end about definitely making sure the company understands how your own personal career values align with the organization. So going beyond what they can find out on their on your resume, right? Most of the time they've read your resume before getting into the interview, right? That's what got you to the interview. Now's the time to really bring you into the interview. So whether it be a critical decision that you made during one of your courses to focus on their company or even a competitor, right? A company that was similar to theirs for a course project or some type of case study. And then bringing that experience into the interview, talking about it and saying, here's why I chose it. I've chose this because Unilever is a focus of mine a year ago when I started my graduate program in marketing and I've continued to follow what you're doing as a company. And here are the things that I focused on in my project. And making those connections for them. Um, it's not going in and saying your mission statement aligns with my values, right? It, it's doing it a little bit more nuanced. It's doing it by showing them you they've been a target of yours for a long time and bringing those experiences and being able to tell an, a compelling story in the interview process. I just, to, to close, the biggest mistake I see students do is shy away from that, where you should be capitalizing on your passion and your, your commitment to that organization and making them see that they've been your top choice, um, you know, for a long time. So, so I, see students miss that opportunity all the time when preparing for interviews. I'll share two bits, uh, you know, two, two nuggets, and I think they build nicely on, on what both of my colleagues have said. One is I think too often students uh, or, or interviewees generally, it doesn't have to be a student, arrive talking a bit too much to an interview about what they want. I want X, I want Y. And I think you need to think more about what I can contribute or what impact I can have. Yeah, so um, the, the stuff you want will come. Um, uh, but people, uh, you know, this notion of reciprocity. So if you can demonstrate what you can do for them, they're much more likely to do good things for you. And the second is, is a similar vein. It's, it's what I've sometimes called do it to be it, yes? Um, so uh, I used to get lots of people calling me when I was uh, head of international strategy, for example, or in, saying, you know, oh, I want to be a strategist. How do I become a strategist, you know? And my counsel to every single person that called was, don't ask me that question. The best way to start becoming a strategist is to call me and say, hey, I've been thinking about your industry and I'm really interested in the various different strategic things going on. And I see that so-and-so just did a deal with another company or you've just partnered with X. That seems interesting. Could you help me? I'm very interested to understand why you're doing that. So you want to be, you know, you want to do the thing. You want to start talking, acting, thinking like a marketer rather than asking questions about what's marketing like or what do you do as a marketer you know you're much more valuable i think to the other person on the side of the table if, if, if you demonstrate to him or her that you're already operating in that role effectively yes i'm already thinking about the issues that a marketing manager might have to think about or what a data you know a marketing right. analyst might have to think about so it's um and and just to echo what everyone has has really said there, there's a theme around research and preparation and i'll tell you that statistically on YF, because as, as many of you, if you're YF users know, we actually conduct first round interviews for many of the companies who use us, and that's how we ensure everyone hears back within 24 hours of every job application. 
what I will say that's pretty crazy is that the statistically the number one reason candidates fail for a certain interview is they didn't do research or they didn't show they did research. And so I think something that I'll, I'll kind of put in in like dating terms is, you know, when you're on a first date, you don't want to play too easy. Like you want to play a little hard to get. Not the time to do it in a first round interview. You don't want to come off as desperate, but you don't want to play hard to get and too cool. And like you have a million offers because A, we're in one of the highest unemployment our, uh, rates our country has seen in many, many years. And B, no company wants to hire someone that doesn't want to, you want them equally. So that's just a, a quick note from a statistics perspective. It, it's spot on. Great. So, um, okay, I'm going to ask one last question. This is so hard because we have so many questions I wanted to ask you guys. And then we're going to switch over to audience because you guys have submitted so many good ones. So let's end with, um, if we could kind of try to do rapid fire, what are the two or three skills, soft or hard, that you think students graduating from school, whether masters, bachelors, whatever, or who are preparing for a career in marketing and communications need to develop and master? Two or three. Great. Um, I can go. Uh, so, so definitely it's something we at Unilever call bias for action. But what it means is that you're a self-starter. You're sort of unafraid to ask questions, to figure things out and start to connect the dots. Um, it is essential because unlike maybe every other step where you sort of knew what was next, you had to go to kindergarten and then you had to go to college and then, you know, maybe for your master's, that's the end of the road. And now you're in the world, you know, of marketing and, and, and you, you, you want to, to figure it out. And so the people who have that kind of self-starter in them, but really take ownership and action for more and more, the more you take on, the more becomes yours. And the more you grow, the more you learn, um, it's okay to fail. It's okay to ask questions that, that seem, you know, dumb, things like that. It doesn't matter. That's how you learn in the beginning. And that's the thing that um, those people who start out really energized um, with that bias for action are, are the ones that succeed. And I think the other is just around consumer curiosity, uh, just like all my other colleagues on the panel have said, but you're interested in people, how they work. You may be marketing products that you had no previous personal interaction matter if you like the products if you like you know you have to understand who the target audience you know what they want what they need why um how to solve their problems and and that just sort of innate curiosity which you'll see talking to people you know in the world around you but also in in, in the world at large is is really important and, and just makes it so fun because you're actually um you know helping to make people's lives a little bit better I'll share. Um, so we definitely uh, at the Wasserman Center do a lot of research around this. And we work with an organization called um, the National Association of Colleges and Employers. It's the professional association that connects college career camp, uh, centers to employers um, for like-minded research um, and interaction. Their top nine skills are all what we consider soft skills. So nothing is marketing specific, nothing is PR specific. So the skills on that list, I think the most important too, flexibility. Employers today want people who can be flexible. You may not get the job right into an organization that you've always dreamt of, but the person who can succeed in that job, have impact, and then grow with that company, that's somebody a, com a company is going to want to retain and invest in. Um, and so flexibility and being able to not be so confined to a certain list of job responsibilities or department or unit within a marketing team will help you just grow in your career and you'll uncover opportunities you didn't even know existed. We see this all the time with our alumni that come back and say five years later, okay, here I am. This is not what I thought I was going to be doing. We even heard it today earlier on. The last thing I'll say, which is so important right now in the world that we're living in, being impactful during uncertainty. If you can be the person that can still have impact, can still problem solve, even during times of uncertainty, you're golden. Yes, I love all of these. It's, uh, these, are, these are absolutely spot on. At NYU, we, uh, we believe that marketing and PR is a human-centered and data-driven enterprise yes and and so i cannot say that more frequently but as marketers we also like our acronyms and our three c's and our four m's and our five p's so i thought of four m's for you liz um and my four m's are meaning messaging math and mattering okay mattering might not even be a word we just made that one up but anyway so me meaning messaging math and mattering let me say so by meaning i think it's very much this idea about being intellectually cu cu curious understanding what things mean, why people do what they do, 
um, you know, developing insights. It's absolutely fundamental to marketing is this notion of meaning and insight. Messaging is really about, and this is more professional messaging than it is messaging to consumers. It's about knowing and understanding your audience, who you're speaking to, who you're presenting to, who you're trying to convince, and then, you know, really skilling, upskilling, retooling your capabilities in PowerPoint, memo writing, persuasive writing, whatever it is. Yeah, so that's about messaging. And then in terms of math, I mean, I don't just mean pure math. I think math is very important, uh, or maths, as we would say in the UK, but math is very important. But I think really I'm, I'm talking about structured problem solving. Yeah, so figuring out how to use analytics and structured solve problems. And then finally, mattering. Mattering is both the sense of, you know, uh, why should I even care? You know, in lots of business environments, especially as a young person, you'll be encountering other people with limited time, limited attention spans. And you've got to think about why should I even care? How is what I'm, what I'm selling, working on doing going to have any impact to the company, but also importantly to the world, yes? And it's, an, it's a thing I believe very firmly in. Marketing and advertising can change the world. We can have impact on the world make it a better place, a fairer place, a more equitable place, a more diverse and inclusive place. And you should think Absolutely. about those things and you should become skilled at thinking about how to act ethically and, and, and matter in the world. So, and, and it will make you a very attractive candidate. Agreed. That's awesome. Um, great advice. And um, someone had actually submitted right before that, Isabel Miss, from, who's an undergrad junior from St. Peter's University, has asked what will be a skill set that's essential across all marketing career paths. And I think you guys all definitely answered that um, flexibility. I think it's not just marketing, to, to Rachel's point. It's, it's all career paths, period. So that's great. Um, okay. I'm going to go into the audience questions now because you guys have asked so many good ones. There's a few themes I'm starting to see. So let me start with... Um, Gloria, who's a grad student in integrated marketing and management and systems from NYU, has a question for Diana. Um, Diana, could you briefly describe your experience of working in digital marketing and branding and CPG since 2013 and how it's changed, how the industry's changed since 2013? Yeah, absolutely. So I think when we think of channel planning, it used to be very simple. Sort of right before I got to CPG, it was like you do TV and you do print and you do a little radio. Um, in the time since maybe late 2000s, but certainly by 2013, figuring out the digital ecosystem, figuring out social media, where consumers are spending their time, how they're getting information, if they're even seeing your information, because now you can choose where you get your news, choose, you know, you, you can have your own tiny sort of echo chamber. So it became a, a much bigger challenge for us as marketers to take the same limited budget and try to figure out um, how we find our, our core consumer, how we reach her in a persuasive way. Um, you used to have a minute or, you know, to, to tell your story. Now you have six seconds. That's a, that's a format we buy all the time. And what can you say in six seconds? Quite a lot if you do a really good job. But these kind of things have been so exciting, nerve, you know, enervating in, in um, over, over the past several years because it keeps changing and, and it will continue to. And I think you really have to have that kind of explorer's mindset. Um, if you're working with a, a very young audience, you're on totally different platforms than if you have a, a millennial now or, or Gen X um, target. So it, it, it's fascinating to figure out the platforms, figuring out the creative unlocks, figuring out new ways so that it's not the same boring stuff that nobody sort of breaks through. Uh, so so that there, there's been a lot of changes and, and expect that it's going to be completely different 10 years from now. Uh, and then how do you still sort of hone those skills that do carry over um, across? Because there is great creative is great creative, but creative and will always be that way. And so how do you learn to do that if you're on the creative side or brief for that and evaluate that if you're on the, the brand side is, is a critical skill that you need to build as well. Awesome. Um, Super helpful. Uh, so we have a few questions from, from three different people, all about very tactical resume advice. So I think we can all probably take a stab at, at these. Um, so let's start with Kelly, who's an undergrad student at the University of Albany, wants to know, when submitting a resume for an internship or full-time job that's more creative, like in marketing, would a creative resume with text boxes and various colors be more suitable or a traditional black and white resume? Um, we can all just do a quick rapid fire. Rachel, go for it. Uh, sure. So I think if you are applying through an applicant tracking system, which many of the large global um, companies do use, I would use a traditional black and white text resume where I would 
flex my creativity is through my LinkedIn profile. So I would put a link to my LinkedIn profile on my resume, then use the LinkedIn profile to link towards some of your more creatively focused projects. You can actually upload PDFs, videos, um, any type of media file really to your LinkedIn profile. And then the employer can look there um, if they wanna see a little bit more of a portfolio of work. Um, so that would be my, my first suggestion. Secondly, if the company is more creatively focused as a whole, right? Maybe it's a smaller company, startup, um, where you're actually sending a resume to an email address or to an individual, I think you have have a little bit more leeway with creativity and you probably could make something that does look a little bit more visually appealing that is reflective of your personal brand but if you're uploading to a, a applicant, applicant tracking system I would err on the side of simple because you don't want your resume not to be read through that through those metrics anyone disagree yeah. with that I, I strongly agree. Uh, I think you can create your own portfolio on, on, on online as well. And some universities, NYU has some e-portfolio tools for students so that they graduate with something in their portfolio. And many creative jobs, uh, you know, or agency jobs you apply for actually will ask you to submit some kind of video or creative idea along. So I would not make your resume the place to get creative. I'm with, Lit, I'm with Rachel in general. It's being sucked into some AI driven <laughs> applicant tracking system and you want it to be as clean, uh, you know, as you, as you can get it. Awesome. Um, this next one, Carolyn, who's a student at the University of Michigan or recent grad, um, one of the two, said, how would you recommend tying a lost or canceled internship due to COVID into your interview process and, and even in your resume? Um, I can quickly share on the resume front and then I definitely want to hear from you guys on the resume on the interview process. And just so everyone knows, there are no right answers to anything that relates to COVID because it's so new. That being said, what we are recommending that we are seeing is most effective right now with employers is to put the canceled internship at the very top of your experience section, not in any of the other sections, but at the top of your experience section because it would have been an experience. And don't add a bunch of lines, just have the job title that you would have had, the company, and then something that says canceled due to COVID-19. That in and of itself from a resume perspective, we're seeing is pretty effective um, versus if you put it in any other section, very often companies, unfortunately, just don't look at your other sections, especially if you're applying for a full-time job or your junior internship. But what about you guys? Um, disagree or agree on the resume? And then especially in the interview process, how should people bring it up? I mean, I think we're, we're, we're all people, we're all living through this together. So ag agree completely with Liz, like we'd understand why it gets canceled. And, you know, it's a way of signaling, hey, like I, I had something I was looking forward to. I've gotten through their vetting process. Um, it, you know, it certainly couldn't hurt. Um, but obviously, there's an understanding that you you missed out on a, a chance to, to, to have employment during that period that wouldn't be held against yeah. you for sure. Yeah, 100% agree with Diana and Liz. I, you should list it. I think, you know, especially if it was hard won and an impressive brand or place to work, then, you know, it is part of your story. You, you made it through their, their vetting process. Be honest, do, you know, be entirely ethical. You either got it or you didn't. You don't want to play games around that. But then in the interview process, what I would do is, is talk about how you used your time instead. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't get this thing, but, you know, I'm still very interested in that industry. And so I, you know, I worked on this nonprofit project for Sunday or the, you know, or I, I found this course that would make me even more valuable when I apply for the job. You, you want to demonstrate forward momentum all the time, you know, and engagement, things like that. And life is full of curves and banana peels and all sorts of things. So everybody understands that. And as Diana said, we're all living through COVID. Um, you, you know, it's a storm that has impacted us all in many different ways. But, but you know, you demonstrate what you did, what resilience and uh, impact you had. So. That's great. And so if, if the good news is, if anyone is listening to what Michael just said and is like, oh, shoot, I haven't done anything to forward myself, it's only early July. You've got the whole rest of summer. So go online, do some Googling, and, and, and find some great resources. And, and we'll send a couple uh, at the end of this as well, especially as it relates to NYU. Great. Um, final question on the kind of tactical front about cover letters and resumes is from Natalie, a rising senior who's studying advertising at the UNC Hudson School of Journalism and Media. And her question is, are cover letters actually read? I've heard a wide range of answers to this question. How do you stand out, especially when many people might be skimming or even skipping them? 
Rachel, do you want to take this first? I'm, I'm worried to answer this before Diana answers, but I will tell you what, what we talk about with students. So cover letters are, you're right, we don't know if employers are reading them. But if a company is asking for one, you, you certainly want to write one. Because what will often happen is a company will have two very similar resumes in their hand and they'll say student A and student B, oh, they have similar majors, similar GPA, similar experiences. Let me go to the cover letter and see if I can learn something about them, about why we should interview them. And you want to use the cover letter to double down on why that company. So don't spend your cover letter rehashing what the person can find on your, on their, on your resume or even your LinkedIn profile. Use your cover letter to add something that they cannot learn about you from your resume. That is often how we hear from employers that they use a cover letter. Does that mean that every cover letter is being read? Unfortunately, no, we don't. But if you want to go the extra step and really make yourself stand out, write the cover letter and use it as a time to go beyond the resume um, because we have heard that that is how students will land interviews and nudge somebody else out for an opportunity. Yeah, um, just to build on to what Rachel said, really at a company like Unilever, it really depends where you're coming from. So if it's a very formal, um, you know, we're going to NYU, we're going to one of your schools and recruiting, your cover letter is extremely important because we may get a stack of 50, 100, and we're reading those cover letters to differentiate. And that's where you're explaining, you know, you're showing who you are because when you look at the bullet points of all of your resumes, you seem very similar on paper from the same school or from the same major. So your cover letters where your spirit comes through, it helps us decide who comes in for the interview. And then in the interview, that's where, you know, I think the, the meat of it comes, but that could make you number 10 on the list or number 11 and maybe there's only 10 spots for interviews so in that case it's it's vital um internally we actually have an opportunity to write cover letters once i did for a job because i was so passionate about it and and i think it helped other times you know you just keep moving on so so it, it if you're going through the linkedin system of applying which is is the way it works for now so many companies um it, it, it might get seen it might not but um if you it, it's your only chance to to say something else before you have an interview I'll just jump in real quick too. For the career changers in the room or our more experienced professionals in the room, a cover letter can be extremely valuable if you don't have direct work experience from your resume for a job. So if you're looking to change into marketing, into communications, we talk a lot with our career changers um, in our integrated marketing and PR programs about how to use that as a platform to show transferable skills and, and again, really why the change, right? Why do you want to be in marketing after being in this unrelated field or function for you know X amount of years? And that can really help an employer further understand, okay, I get why this person's applying to, to my company and my role. So that's another way we've seen them be very helpful. I'll say something slightly different than, than what you guys shared, which is, um, and I do agree, if they ask for a cover letter, give the cover letter. If you don't, there's a chance you might just be knocked out for that alone. But we see statistically that people who have cover letters, when you're applying for a job that's hiring in mass, which means more than 25 people at a time, are not read. Most of the time, statistically, are not read at all. However, and this is entry level, so I'm not talking about people who have five to 10 years experience. However, the cover letters are part of your interview packet that are given to the hiring manager. So it's the final round interview that we often see that they play a big role. Whereas at the very beginning, whether you get an interview, it's often based on, are you simply qualified for the job? Your answers you know, to the application questions and so on. So um, it's just one more perspective. Um, great, I wanna go to the next question. Um, Adam, who's a recent grad from Indiana University said, what softwares or computer programs are essential or important for marketing in 2020? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I think the, the answer to this question may be slightly unsatisfying, which is that it, I, I, it's rather than think about it, any single piece of software, you know, that is essential. I think you should think about classes of software. Yes. And typically if you learn, so, you know, there's always a debate, should I learn Python or should I learn R or SPSS or SAS or whatever, you know, learn one of them. Certainly if you learn the programming language and then you'll find the other relatively easy to pick up, you know, um, if you go to work in an environment where Python is used and R is not, it doesn't really matter. So learn something in the category. Um, you know, I think data visualization software, depending on what kind of job you have, obviously if you're on a sort of side where you're going to leverage data and present data, then you need something, you know, like Python, R, SPSS, you need great data visualization tools like Tableau. 
Um, I think everybody should learn Excel. You know, it's used widely. And PowerPoint and Microsoft Word, that goes almost without saying. And then I think you've got to familiarize yourself with some of the, you know, MarTech, AdTech, and ComTech technology, whether it's Scission in ComTech or whether it's, you know, Google AdWords or whether it's Marketo or, you know, you, you have to try as best as you can familiarize yourself with them. Many of those software vendors uh, have uh, educational uh, partnerships or have student additions or online training programs. But, you know, I would encourage you to worry a little less about the specific software and, and, and more about, you know, uh, you know, that you've mastered types of software. Um, and I, you know, maybe Liz, it's a project we'd be happy to do with you. We could do some res you know, sort of job post scanning and see which, which ones comes up as the most popular. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I, would, I would rather you all think about it as, as categories, partly because the software itself changes rapidly. So. Diana, any software that you typically look for candidates to know? No, I mean, PowerPoint and Excel, you live in those. I mean, it's, it's very, very focused. We do have all sorts of database and consumer, but if you have a general analytical mindset, you can pick that up on the, on the job. Um, the only other thing I was thinking about is just general business acumen. It, it wouldn't hurt if you start in your chosen industries reading the annual reports, the 10Ks, the more you understand the structure of businesses, where they make their decisions, the better, because you're gonna jump into a piece of that, or you're going to be um, the advisor or the creative for um, some of these, these brands or industries, and it will help so much if you understand where they're making trade-offs, what their, what their structure is like, and um, where their focus may be um, in the, the medium and long-term as well. So that would be where I'd really spend my focus, especially if I didn't have a strong previous business background. Awesome. All right. We unfortunately only have time for one last question. And then I want to make sure everyone has a few resources that I'll make sure I post into the chat at the end. Um, so if you're interested in, in uh, maybe attending NYU in the future, checking more out about their programs or working at Unilever, well, we'll send out some links in a minute. But um, for the final question, let's go with, you know, we're in a pandemic, so I can't ignore this question. Um, it's a great one. So Lily, who's an MS integrated marketing candidate from NYU said, considering the current pandemic, what should students do to navigate the job search, um, especially international students, she wants to know given some of the laws that have been passed recently. Um, and I'll add in not just job search, but even networking professionally. Advice, would love to hear it. Great. I'd say for networking, nothing has changed, right? The, the only difference is you're not going to the coffee shop to meet, but especially if this is an international search or, or a remote search, it's easier than ever to pick up Zoom and meet somebody face to face where we're all home, we're all working, we're all on video all day, and we're we're here to to learn and help you know future marketers um, figure out their careers, strategize and um, and and land roles. So um, find the people who you're interested in talking to through your personal networks, through your universities. Um, that's a great place to start. Um, then you can kind of go cold onto LinkedIn. But um, it is it is definitely we understand it. We have remote working for the foreseeable future. We have remote interns. It it couldn't be more comfortable for us. And then companies are all in different places as far as what their hiring guidelines are, how they're managing international, if you might be able to be remote for a long time, if that wasn't typically, you know, as much as some things may be getting worse, some things might be getting more flexible. So um, worth having those conversations now to see if it's if it's viable with your, your visa standing and things like that as well. I'll add, Diana, great points. And I'll just share, I worked with a student yesterday who's sitting in Indonesia, but doing a virtual brand management internship for a company sitting here in New York. So, um, you know, I don't want to paint a, a overly positive picture because there is so much, you know, uh, challenge right now, but there is opportunity remotely just for work experience that you never could have gotten had we been in you know, pre-COVID. So I, I want to stress thinking of it as an opportunity. With that said, there is going to come a point, and we're seeing it right now, unfortunately, with new restrictions and in how international students can have global mobility with their careers. Um, what we are doing here at NYU, and we've always really done this, is stressing not a plan A and plan B, but having at least plan A, plan A, and even like a plan A over here. So you want to be having multiple 
uh, focuses for your job search. At the same time that you are looking for opportunities, possibly maybe in New York or California, I, I do think you want to be at the same time building a network of people, understanding target companies in your you know, home country or home market so that when you do turn to those, it's not a plan B and you have to scramble to get to the contacts and the people that to help you, but you sort of have these two plans going at the same time. Anybody, regardless if you're at NYU or somewhere else, a, your career services office can help you with that time management. It does take a lot of time and I, you know, I don't want to ignore that, but if, there, if you do have the summer right now and you're not doing a remote opportunity, it's a great time to sort of project plan those strategies and, and turn to your career center that are doing virtual appointments and get that help with the time management piece. Um, so that would be my advice. Yeah, I would, I would just build on all of that. I would say a couple of things. One is, um, you know, going back to some of the things we talked about uh, earlier, one is that a network is an exponential thing. It's the nature of network externalities, network economics, many of you have studied that, is that your, your job is not to get a job from an individual. It's to start expanding that network, yes, because you meet Rachel and Rachel has you in mind and then she meets someone else and she says, oh, you two should be interested together. So think about your network as something you want to just grow and invest in. Um, and that it, it will yield something over time as opposed to any single interaction must yield, uh, you know, because you'll be very disappointed. But the second thing I would say is, and it's sort of akin to some of the things I mentioned before, is when you reach out to people on LinkedIn, and I encourage you to do that. Some people are very generous with their time, others less so, but, but do it in the context of not, I'm a graduate and I'm looking for a job. You know, that's, that's, that's very challenging because what do I say to you? You know, it, it, I don't have a job, so what do I say? So I think it's better if you can to say, look, you know, go back to what I was talking about is, you know, you know, I'm a graduate and I've done a bunch of work in sports marketing. And I think this is a really interesting opportunity. Or here is a report that I found absolutely fascinating. Maybe you'd find that interesting. You know, that is better networking. There's the sort of reciprocity thing I talked about before, you know, do something, you know, demonstrate that you're um, already engaging as a colleague almost, you know. So I would encourage you to do that. Think of networking not as sort of uh, email blasts, uh, you know, I want a job, but here's something that you might find of value or here's something I've been working on or here's something I'm interested in discussing with you. So, And, awesome. and, 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 and sorry, and I, just to underline the international point, sorry, Liz, is, is the, we, we live and work in an increasingly global environment. And even as, you know, local brands, uh, you know, the go local versus go global has become an interesting discussion in marketing. Even as that's true, we all of us, curious, engaged marketers, want to know what you have. You know, we want to know what you know. As a younger generation, as a global generation, as a digital generation, uh, believe me, there are many, many, many marketers. In fact, at Time Warner, we used to have a reverse mentoring program. You know, we're literally, you know, the older executives would sit with younger people and things, many of them out of NYU, actually, we used to work with NYU. But, but anyway, the point only is you bring something of value. So don't, don't, don't be too humble in a sense. You know, you, you actually have a perspective. How, how could your brand launch in, in India? I've, you know, or what, what's going on with, you know, digital marketing and micropayments in China? Or, you know, all these kind of things are critically important how we think about the growth of brands around the world. And, and most marketers, I think, would find your perspective interesting. So, so you know, uh, nurture that. So. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, I'm so sorry to everyone whose questions we couldn't answer because we got a lot of them. But um, Michael, Rachel, Diana, I'm so grateful to the three of you for answering all these questions. I've learned a lot and I'm sure many people uh, in the audience have also learned a lot. Um, I do want to do a few quick shout outs. Um, I sent these out in the chat. You'll see three links, so feel free to quickly go ahead and go in there and copy and paste those. So if you're interested in a career at Unilever or learning more about working there, um, while they might not have that many entry level post, roles posted at the, set, at the moment, they will soon. So just go ahead and click on that link. You can join their talent network and then they will absolutely be looking at your resume and information as soon as they start to ramp up their recruitment again. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about a marketing graduate degree or certificate or learning more about all of the academics that NYU has to offer, there's I don't know many places that uh, could even are in that level of marketing uh, curriculum. So you have to go check out that website. 
um, the links right there. And then finally, um, we had a few questions about interview tips. How do I answer this kind of question, et cetera? So I wanted to do a quick plug for a, a website that we have on WayUp that's within a guide. And it has actually a bunch of videos of how to answer, how to tell me about, your, uh, tell me about yourself, et cetera. So feel free to check that out. Um, with that, uh, I will end on a positive note that we are in a pandemic. There are still ways to network. You just heard all of them from Diana, Michael, and Rachel, and there are still companies that are hiring. So do not give up. Um, let's all make sure that we're taking this summer to realize that we are all in this together. As Diana said earlier, everyone is going through the same thing. Everyone is being affected in different ways. And so um, just stay strong and keep your head up and keep applying for roles if, if you're looking for an, an opportunity and if you cannot find one. I love that Michael and, and Rachel had alluded to this earlier. Take your summer and really use it to learn and use it to get as many experiences as you can online, even if it's not working for a company. So with that, Rachel, Michael, Diana, thank you all so much for joining and to everyone who's tuning in, thank you so much. We will be sending out the recording to uh, everyone who, who are RSVP'd. So thank you all, take care. Thank you all. Thank Stay you. safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone.